So let's begin with the purpose of the garden. And I want to begin by asking a simple question. Why did God plant a garden? I just want you to think about God's own happiness for a moment, his own perspective. I mean, just think about the view that God has of the cosmos. Every day, or humanly speaking, he sees hundreds of billions of spinning galaxies. So why would he decide to create a little planet that has green meadows and still waters? Well, the answer is obvious, because he is loving. Okay, God is completely self-sufficient, which means he doesn't need anything, okay? God lacks nothing. And so he actually made the world for our enjoyment. And we already saw Jesus refer to the first person of the Godhead as Father. So not only is he God who is uh, eternally generating the cosmos from within himself, but he is eternally pouring out love. And so he creates beings, he creates humans to love and to be loved. And so as we said in verse 8, God made the garden, he formed the man, and he put him right there in the garden. And he told him to be the guardian of the garden, to cultivate it, to keep it, to have dominion over the world. He made a helper for him, Eve, and God commenced both of them, Adam and Eve. He said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Christian author Nancy Guthrie gives a great explanation into the purpose of the garden. She says, clearly, an expansion project was in the works. It was God's intention that the garden would spread so that the whole earth would become a home, one he could share with his image bearers. I love that phrase, expansion project. You know, sometimes we we think you know, we need to get back to the garden, that that was the source of perfection. And she goes on to say, you know, the garden actually wasn't about perfection. It was about potential. Okay, yes, it was unspoiled, but it was also unfinished. It was incomplete. And so as Adam and Eve would be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it, they would push the boundaries of the garden and thereby spread the rule and the reign of God throughout the entire world. So the garden was replete with so many trees, but there was two trees in the Garden of Eden that were very unique, and each of them served a unique purpose. And this is like introduction to good and evil right here. Let's pick up in verse 9. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay, so those are the two trees, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So let's skip down to verse 16 and 17. And the Lord God commanded the man. Now, side note, who has authority over man? The Lord God, who is also a father, saying, you may surely eat of every tree in the garden, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. Okay, so there's two trees in the garden, and it represents two choices. Okay, so the tree of life represents the satisfaction that God gives, whereas the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is the opposite. It represents, and I love what Tim Savage calls it, an alternative path to satisfaction. Okay, the tree of life represented the satisfaction that only comes from God. But the tree of the knowledge of good and evil represented an alternative path to satisfaction. And you know, this actually makes sense philosophically when you think about good and evil, because both of them must exist. And if you think of or ask the question, what is evil or what is the essence of evil? Most apologists say that it's actually the absence of good. Okay, evil isn't a thing in and of itself, it's just the absence of good. And so we can only understand what good is when we have a knowledge of what evil is. I'll give you some examples. So rust on a car, 
Okay, so rust is the absence of metal, or it's the absence of a shiny, waxed vehicle. And if your name is Jeremy Carroll or Curtis Green, you know exactly what I'm talking about because your car is very shiny and perfect. Okay, so rust would be the opposite of a nice vehicle. And it's a form of evil. A cavity, right? A cavity in your tooth is the absence of a tooth. And so a cavity is a form of evil. Rotten fruit, right? We only appreciate a nice, ripe, uh, ripe piece of fruit if we know what a rotten fruit is. Okay, so evil is simply the absence of good. And what God is doing is he is designing a framework for morality, Okay, so right there, overlapping all the laws of physics were the law of the spirit of life and the law of sin and death. Okay, the penalty for sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Now, God did want Adam and Eve to have a knowledge of evil. That's why he put the tree in the garden. But he wanted them to have a head knowledge, okay, not a heart knowledge. He didn't want them to have an actual experience of evil. I heard one author explain it this way. God intended for us to be masters over temptation, not slaves to sin. So simply put, the, the purpose of the garden is that it would be an environment where human beings could flourish, a place to love and be loved by God and others, and there they would exercise dominion and reflect God's image to the world. But the problem in the garden is that there was this little slithering serpent who came and he persuaded Adam and Eve to step outside of God's design for them, to eat of the tree, to break God's command. And this actually triggered or activated the law of sin and death and thereby reversed or brought corruption to all of these wonderful things. 